Number 7. Ephesians, 3rd quarter, 2023. Daniel Duda. Lesson 7, Ephesians, the unified body of Christ. Julie is going to offer us a prayer. So thank you, Julie. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you are with us today. Thank you that you give us so many blessings and opportunities, even in the midst of difficulties and trials. Lord, those who are listening that are struggling, you are right there with them. We ask you to bless them. Please open our hearts and our minds. Help us to learn something new. Help us to live something new because we saw something beautiful in you and in your word today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you, Julie, for the prayer. Ephesians, you had the a capable teaching of John Pauline for the first half. And now we go to chapter 4. And let's start with chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and greatness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Do you see what's going on here? The first three chapters talked about our riches in Christ. Chapters 4 to 6 talk about our responsibilities in Christ. The key word will be walk. It's in verse 1, in verse 17, 5, 2, 5, 8, 5, 15. So the metaphor of the Christian life is walking. It's not something static. It's dynamic. And then Paul will admonish people to walk in unity, in purity. That's from verse 17 to 517, 417 to 517. Then in harmony, chapter 5. And then in victory, that will be 610 to the end of the chapter. The armor of God. So you walk with in unity, in purity, in harmony, and in victory. Four basic things, what Christian life looks like. Now, before we look into that, it's important to notice two words from verse 1. The first one is the very first one, therefore. The word therefore makes the connection with the first three chapters. Because of what God has done in Christ, because of the unity, no difference between Gentiles and Jews, because the wall of division was destroyed. We are now one community. Therefore, what God has done has certain consequences for our lives. We live in a certain way based on what God has accomplished. And the other one is besiege. So in the first part regarding the therefore, he talked about our wealth. We are called by grace to belong to his body, chapter 1. We, you have been raised from dead. You were dead in sins, but now you are sitting in the heavenly places. You have been reconciled. Remember, the wall of division was done away with. And Christ's victory over Satan is reality, but still a mystery. It's not yet fully seen. So he still has the power. And therefore, you walk in unity. You put off the old clothes and walk in purity. You are reconciled, so you walk in harmony. And because Christ was victorious, you walk in victory. And now comes the besiege indicates that God is urging us to live in glory. Notice he doesn't say, as he did in the Old Testament, I command you. He doesn't say, if you obey me, I will bless you. Now, that's an important talk that children need to hear. If you don't brush your teeth, mom or papa will be upset. If you brush your teeth, I'm going to bless you. No. Now, he says, you have already been blessed. Now, in response to my love and grace... Make sure you walk in that. So can you see the shift because of what happened on the cross? So if you are looking the Old Testament forward and it's not clear what God is going to do, what is going to happen, God takes them out of Egypt, the salvation act, Exodus, and says, now let's gather around Sinai and listen. They say, oh, all these things we will do. And he gives them the commandments. If you obey you will be blessed. If you disobey, you will be cursed. Once the Christ event happened, and you are looking from the New Testament perspective back at cross of Calvary, what is the verb? I beseech you. I beg you. Please. This has already happened. This is reality. Look back into it. And in light of that, now you do your walk accordingly. 
So these are the two key words of chapter 4 of Ephesians. Because of what happened in the first three chapters, what God has done, you belong by grace to his body, you were raised from dead in sins and trespasses, and you participate in the victory of Christ over Satan. You walk in unity, in harmony, purity, harmony, and victory. All right? What kind of walking or what kind of vocation is he talking about? So, walk in the manner worthy of your calling. What is the calling? Is it the calling to be a housewife, to be a nurse, to be a medical doctor, to be a lawyer, to be an office executive assistant? What is the calling here? Yes, Terry? Well, wouldn't it be by way of the way you live your life, the way that you interact with the people in your community and your family, represent all of the character of God, everything that we've learned about who God is, and witness to the fact that he is not all the bad things that have been accused of him? Sure. So the calling is to live out the grace of God. You have participated in that grace of God that you have received. Now you belong. You who were not even citizens, you were not part of the commonwealth, you were outside, now you belong. You are insiders. So walking worthy of that calling means walk in light of the grace that you have received. Make sure you show grace to others. Make sure that people see God in a different light. Bob? Well, you mentioned different professions that are secular titles, but when you look at the memory text, we essentially overlap with those in a sense. So, say if I'm working as a lawyer, I can also be helping in other aspects. Yeah, we will come to those spiritual gifts We're not later. There yet. Yes. Okay. So when we talk about unity, how does God achieve unity? We'll talk about that. But remember, the calling here is not your professional vocation. It's the calling that all Christians have to walk modeling the grace we have received. Henry? And I think we find it in chapter 3, verse 6, when Paul is mentioning that the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are hers together with Israel. So that's that calling, that vocation. Consider those that you sometimes thought were nothing like, consider them just like you. So that's a calling for treating others in a Jesus way, saying they are members together in one body. Can you imagine that? Part of household. Exactly. It, that's absolutely, probably it was mind-shocking for them at that time because how can you consider a Gentile? part of your own body. So I think that's a tremendous calling. So you have the calling of Abraham. Through you, all the families, all the tribes of the earth will be blessed. That's the original calling. Fast forward a few centuries, and what happens by the time Jesus comes? By the time of Ezra and Nehemiah? Exclusivistic club. They look down on them. They are goyim. They are the Gentiles. They are the dogs. They are unclean. They are not worthy to belong to our family, to our household. And Paul says, no, 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 that's not how God sees it. They are as precious as you are. They are God's children as much as you are. They are part of the household. They are part of that victory that Christ achieved. And this wall of separation needs to go. We cannot have that in the body of Christ. And the unity is not uniformity. Back to Henry. And that is a tremendous calling for us today. Yes. Because I beseech you, walk in that calling. Realize what happened. If it was so kind of intuitive for them, it has to be the same for us today. Something that we cannot even imagine. Those sometimes people that we think don't meet the standard, that's the calling. How can we make them one body? Yeah. And for that to happen, you need what? Verse 2, you need humility. So if you are considering yourself better than them, if you divide the world us versus them, you are not walking in humility. Because you were out and God stooped down to you and included you in. So you can't exclude. Remember, the Pharisees measure their sanctification by how big is the circle of people they exclude. God measures his love by how big is the circle of people he includes. So it needs to be in humility and gentleness and patience. Why? Because we are not there yet. It's messy. Working with people, it's messy. You need patience. 
bearing with one another in love. And you do that all eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So what will be the next value that is important, that our walking needs to create? Unity. I will explore it. Livius. My translation has a reference to walking in the manner worthy of the calling to Philippians 1.27. And it says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Remember that old story about the supervisor in the field? When he's not there, he puts a scarecrow there, and people work because somebody's looking at them. And so finally they put the hat so that it helps them to slack off because he's not looking at us, doesn't see. Paul says, whether I am there or not, shouldn't make any difference. You don't work on external motivation. God sees you anywhere. If you understand the gospel, the motivation will be inward motivation, not outward external motivation. Whether I am there or not doesn't make any difference. You will live the same life. Have you heard about Bata, Bata Shoes, a Czech famous entrepreneur, shoemakers to the world? He came to America to learn from Henry Ford, and then he built this Bata city, Moravia, not far from where Ashley's ancestors came. And he had this office in an elevator. So you have a long office, And the offices are there, first floor, second floor, third floor, first skyscraper in that insignificant Moravian city being inspired by America. And every few hours, the office would move to the next elevator because he discovered that people in the offices worked better when they saw that, oh, the boss is looking there through the corridor. The boss is not around, can slack off Thomas Bata. All right, so let's go to verses four to six. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Mm -hmm. Why is unity such an important concept for Paul? Can you see he uses the word one seven times? Most theologians say that this list is something that was handed down. So somebody else wrote this list, that we Christians are characterized, that we serve one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father, who is all in all and over all. So that he uses a list that was handed down, probably as a baptismal confession, so that this list is not original with Paul, but he uses something that was already in place by early Christians. So you remember what he talked about in chapter 2? By grace you have been saved. And then from verse 11, you that at one time were Gentiles in the flesh, called uncircumcised, but those who pride themselves on being circumcised, but it's only a circumcision made by hand, not the one that God looks at, the heart. Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, stranger to the covenants, not participating in the promises, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus you are one. So how does he develop this idea of unity forward? So what is the significance? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Remember, in the Soviet Union era, those churches which were officially registered with the government had to submit a statistical report on how the church is progressing. And if the church is progressing and doing really well, then it's suspicious and then they need to do something. I know pastors who lost their permission to do the clergy work because they have been successful, like, for example, in the work with the youth. That was really a red flag. So when they reported the statistics, how many people died, this is how many people died. How many people have been baptized, they would put one. Because the Bible says one baptism. (laughs) Because if you report too many, (laughs) then you are suspicious and you are immediately under the microscope. So the Bible says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. (laughs) We don't need to report more than one. Which is an interesting thing because in our world we try to impress with the number of baptisms and they said, no, we need to fly under the radar. We don't need to impress anyone. So one baptism. (laughs) What's the most important thing about the body of Christ for Paul? What's the most important characteristic 
of the body of Christ. Unity. Seven times he uses the word one to emphasize if the body of Christ is not united, you misunderstood something about the grace of God. Okay, Aris? It seems to me that uh, after the Tower of Babel, human beings have had that desire to set themselves apart from, to distinguish themselves from others, to define in-groups and who does not belong. And the gospel reverses kind of that phenomenon. All of a sudden, diverse as human beings are, can find unity because the connecting point is Christ, is the Savior, God's work for us. Christ is that center that brings people together that otherwise, without the gospel, would never even find commonalities or any reason for worshiping or being together. So, false morality, sin, works on exclusion. You are not as good as I am. Remember the medieval royalty? We have blue blood in our veins. We are not like commoners. And God works by inclusion. And it's interesting that in the Tower of Babel, they have a sense of unity, of purpose. Let's build the tower to reach to heaven. And God says, that this type of unity is not going to bring you there. And he brings a different type of unity where everybody has its place, his or her own place. Everybody has a contribution to make. John? So I find it a bit interesting, and maybe it's simplistic to think of it that way, but I'm always curious to ask why we're created so differently if unity is the goal. We're so intrinsically created to notice difference, right? From the time we're babies, we react to difference without even learning, really. The moment we're born, the facial expressions of a baby reacts to something that is not expected. Color, sound, all of that. That's just how we're made. So to then be so ingrained with noticing difference, and at the same time, the ultimate goal is unity, to me seems like such a contradiction and almost impossible to do because that's just who we are. And we use it positively and negatively, right? We can use it in a positive, oh my gosh, this person has an absolutely beautiful voice. I don't have that gift and I can appreciate that gift in someone else. Now we use that in very horrible ways too. But I don't know. I think I would love to be able to get that answer at some point to say, if unity was the goal, shouldn't we all just like look alike, sound alike, be alike? <laughs> would that not have been a little bit less complicated? Why did we go this route? I would like to understand that a little bit better. It definitely would be less complicated, but in the universe of God, it would be boring. And this tells you something about who God is. I read on the Wikipedia that there are 512 types of shark. Can you believe that? Who needs 512 types of shark? Now, if I read that there are 512 types of roses or tulips or substitute whatever flower is your favorite, yeah, but who needs 512 types of shark? Wouldn't a couple just be enough? But if God creates 512 types of sharks, or at least those are those that survive till today, maybe he created even more, it tells you that evidently God loves variety and diversity. The DNA is intentionally created in a way that genetic characteristics create for diversity, produce diversity, so we are all different. And especially after the fall, we cannot live with it. So we create the caste system or way of humiliating other people because they are different and exploiting them because they are different. Because somehow we cannot live with it. Imagine when God freezes water in the atmosphere, he gets what? Snowflakes. You examine snowflakes under the microscope and you discover they are all unique. They are all different. When human beings freeze water, what do you get? Ice cubes. Identical blocks of boringly homogeneous uniformity. 
And it's a metaphor of human society. When God freezes water, you get unique ice snowflakes. When we do, you get ice cubes. Livius. It says here, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So the unity is the spirit that unifies. And notice that there's a bond, there's a connection, and the spirit unifies the diversity the many different personalities, the many different individuals. The unity happens because of the spirit. And we need the diversity. We need, the body has a bunch of different parts and they all do their own thing separately. And so if we were all the same, we would have nothing to give. There'd be no reason you couldn't participate in this concept of giving because you're making the same thing as the next guy. You're doing the same, you know, there's no diversity, there's no difference. So I think the diversity is key in this principle of giving because now I have something to offer to the other or to another that may not have the same capability or understanding, whatever it is, I have something to participate. I participate in this cycle of giving, being diverse, being able to diverse. And the unity is the spirit. The spirit is the one that unifies all of that. So when Jesus was here on this planet, he chose his disciples and he calls Levi and he says, I'm going to call you Matthew. You are a gift of God. Imagine a tax collector The guy who says, as long as you make few shekels, as long as you make some money, what's wrong with serving Romans? What's wrong with cheating your fellow Jewish neighbor, as long as I profit from that? Jesus walks by him one day, looks at him and says, I am going to call you the gift of God. Come, be part of my community, Matthew. And then he calls Simon the Zealot. You know what the Zealots believed? They are the terrorists of the day. Zealots believe that every knife which is not in the back of a Roman soldier is a wasted knife. And Jesus says, and the two of you are going to room together as we roam the hills of Galilee. Can you imagine those evening discussions? When they lag behind Jesus, what did those two talk about? And then Jesus is gone and says, it's beneficial for you if I go, because when I go, the Spirit will come. And what's the role of the Spirit? To create that unity. So that Matthew and Simon the Zealot can live as part of one community and make their own contribution. Because Matthew or Levi, the tax collector, who sees nothing wrong with collaborating with occupying force of Romans, needs to listen to and talk to Simon the Zealot, who hates Romans with all the power of hatred he's capable of producing. Because that's the body of Christ. And Paul says, you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand who God is who creates all this diversity, the tapestry that he's producing out of that, the contribution that each one of you has to make so that there is one faith, one baptism, one goal, one purpose for it all. Henry? This was important for Paul. This unity was not a rhetorical knowledge for him. It was experiential. He was the one that didn't believe in unity. That's right. That's why he makes emphasis on the bond of peace, because he was trying to achieve it by force. Destroy it. Destroying, exactly. Not achieving the unity, not by bonding them, but by destroying the difference. Yeah. You have to believe like I do, because then we have the uniformity. Because only the ones that I consider good are left, right? I will make sure that we have unity when I finish with the ones that are not worthy. So I think when Paul is writing this, he's not talking to them. He's talking from his own experience, facing himself on the mirror and saying, I know what I'm talking about because I am coming from there. And I on the comment of why that diversity is because that reflects the entirety of God, right? We are all one facet of how God looks like. So when there is no diversity, when we are not reflecting the entirety of him, that's why he needs 512 different sharks, because every single one of them will be reflecting one little facet of that loving God. The smallest one is 7 inches, and the largest one is 40 feet. 7 inches shark. Everyone has something to contribute. Paul experiences the shock of the encounter with God's grace 
And he never recovered from that. Completely overturned his perception. Before that, he goes to Damascus because it's okay to destroy other human beings. They are different than me. They don't believe like I do. God is not pleased and happy with them. And from now on, after encountering God's grace, he's going to have this high view of church, of the community, which is the body of Christ, where everybody makes a contribution. Everybody is important. Nobody is perfect, but everybody is welcome. Imagine all the indescribable suffering that racism, nationalism, tribalism, sexism, one gender is not good enough to portray who God is. Because there is one God, but even that one God exists in relationships. as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sexism, ageism, sectarianism, and other suffering throughout the centuries. We humans only feel safe and comfortable when we are surrounded with people who think like us, act like us, talk like us, dress like us, and eat like us. The same way as we do. Then we are safe and secure. And God is going to destroy that. He's going to redeem this by becoming a bridge builder. By coming down, takes 12 tribes from four different mothers. Who of all should understand this? Then 12 brothers who are from four mothers, one father, they are going to be the model of diversity. No. Fast forward a few decades, centuries, it's into uniformity. You are not like us. You are not part of the exclusivistic club. So he comes again in the person of ultimate Pontifex Maximus, the bridge builder, and starts a new type of community. And when he's gone, the Holy Spirit will continue the work. And what is the work? To create supernatural unity from different temperaments, different genders, different ages, different nationalities, different tribes, languages, you name it. And when the crowd of the redeemed is portrayed in Revelation, is it the factory cookie cutter, homogeneous crowd? No from every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. And they brought to New Jerusalem their own glory. Everybody brings their own contribution. It's still not a homogeneous crowd. It's still a diverse crowd. So the Bible shows that God has this divine ambition to build a genuine community out of human diversity. And so there is not only a new way of looking at the natural human diversity, which are caused by differences of gender, like male and female, or ethnic origin, Jew and Gentile, but also the cultural diversity due to differences in socio-economical status, like slave and free. And because all this diversity is not enough, that we are males and females and Jews and Gentiles and Americans and... Uh, Guatemalan and Romanian and Czech and Costa Rican and Zimbabwean and Papua New Guinea. Let's not forget those. Yes, they listen as well <laughs> to Pinal. What does he do? Verse 8. Because that diversity is not enough, he's going to make it worse. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. And let's read 9. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity. Mm -hmm. So what is this, verse 8? When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to people. Can you see there in your Bible? Livius will say what on the margin, or a footnote? Mm -hmm. Well, it quotes Psalm 68. Oh, it will help you the things that you and I would not know because we don't know the Old Testament that well. It will tell you, ah, this is actually a quotation from Psalm 68. And Psalm 68 portrays the Lord, Yahweh, is like an ancient general. You need to understand the battle, 
So a king goes into a battle. And then if things go well, he defeats another king. And then he comes back to his capital city. And he rides on a white horse, meaning that he was victorious. And he goes first in the procession because he gained the victory. He is the king. After him go his generals. And after him go in chains the king and the generals of the defeated nation. And then go his soldiers who carry the spoils, what they looted from that nation. And then comes the big celebration. And what is part of that celebration? They are going to kill the king, the defeated, and his generals. They finish them off. And then part of that celebration, he's going to take the loot, the spoils, and distribute it to his soldiers, to his generals, and to his people. Those who participated in the battle will get more. And those who stayed home and provided the food, etc., they will get less. But everybody participates in victory. Now, what does it tell you that Paul says, you know, God is like an ancient general, using the metaphor from the army? Yes, leave you. Let me read Psalm 68, 18. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. And notice, receiving gifts, Paul is going to change into giving gifts. And he says, when Jesus died, he says to Mary, don't hold me back because I need to ascend to the Father. And remember, Matthew tells you that when Jesus died, the graves were open and the bodies were thrown into the street. And then on Sunday morning with the resurrection of Jesus, these dead bodies came to life. And when Jesus is resurrected and ascends to the Father, according to Revelation, 24 elders, he takes them in his train. Here are the captives. Here are the representatives of humanity. And those who believe in me will share the same fate as I do. They will be resurrected. So Paul says, and this is what happened on the day of ascension. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost. When he is enthroned as a king, what does he do? Now he gives gifts to his army, to his soldiers, to his body. And because the diversity which is there in creation, like 512 types of shark, is not enough, and being different temperaments, different genders, different age, different nationalities, languages, cultures, you name it, it's not enough. He's going to complicate it, to make it worse, to increase the diversity by giving spiritual gifts. So that on top of being an introvert, and an extrovert, being intuitive and being sensing and being perceiving and being judging, which doesn't mean perceptive and judgmental, not at all. <laughs> you also have an evangelist, someone who can put the finger on the pulse and say, Madam, you have been studying the Bible for six months. Don't you think the time has come for you to make a decision? You ask a teacher to do that and you can guarantee eight of ten times they will get it wrong. They will apply pressure when they shouldn't, and they will let people walk away from baptism pool when they are ready to make a commitment for Christ. Because teachers just don't have that gift. They don't feel it that now it's time to make a decision. And you have those teachers who can connect the dots. Remember the sheet of paper in the primary school? Connect one to two, two to three, three to four, and you connect it, and there is, voila, there is a duck. I have no clue there was a duck on this piece of paper. But the teachers have that supernatural capacity to connect the dots and say, wow, I have never seen that in the Bible. Yeah, because it takes a gift of teacher. And there you have those with the gift of mercy who can put their arms around you and whew, everything is easier. But it's a gift. Some people don't have a merciful bone <laughs> in the whole body. you know, And some people have the gift of mercy. So, Terry, let's read. Once upon a time, the animals decided they must do something heroic, or at least meaningful, to meet the problems of a new world. So, they organized a school. They adopted an activity curriculum consisting of running, climbing, swimming, and flying. Because they believed that all are created equal, all the animals took all the subjects. And it also made it easier to administer the curriculum. The duck was excellent at swimming. 
In fact, better than his instructor, but he made only passing grades in flying and was very poor in running. Since he was slow in running, he had to stay after school and also drop swimming in order to practice running. This caused his web feet badly worn, and as a result, he was only average in swimming. But average was quite acceptable in school, so nobody worried about that, except the duck. The rabbit started at the top of his class in running, but had a nervous twitch in his leg muscles because of so much makeup work in swimming. If he did not stop, he would have a nervous breakdown. The squirrel was excellent in climbing until he encountered constant frustration in the flying class where his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of the tree to down. He also developed charley horses from overexertion and then got a C in climbing and a D in running. The eagle was a problem child and was disciplined severely for being a nonconformist. In the climbing class, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but insisted on using his own way to get there. All right, so what do you do? What's the end of it? How do you solve the problem like that? The result was? At the end of the year, an abnormal eel that could swim exceedingly well and also run, climb, and fly a little, had the highest average and was the class valedictorian. The prairie dog stayed out of school and fought the tax levy because the administration would not add digging and burrowing to the curriculum. They apprenticed their children to a badger and later joined the groundhogs and gophers to start a successful private school. And then Fish came home from school and said, Mom, Dad, I hate school. Swimming is great, I enjoy it. Flying is fun, but they always start me in the water. But why should I learn running and climbing? I don't have any legs, I don't have any wings, and I can't breathe out of water. So the Fish parents made an appointment with the principal, who took one look at the progress report and said, You are so far ahead of the rest of the class in swimming, that we are going to let you skip swimming classes altogether and we need to give you private tutoring in running and climbing. And so last time the fish was seen was heading to Canada to request a political asylum. <laughs> so here is the bottom line. The body of Christ, the church, is the place where fish can swim, rabbits can run, eagles can fly, because in the body of Christ nobody is an average duck. Can you see why, after encountering God's grace, the body of Christ, the community of believers for Paul, is such an important concept? That he stood up into face to Peter and say, you can't have exclusion in the body of Christ. You don't get it. You don't get what Jesus did on the cross. We are not going to tolerate this. We need to be a community where everybody has to make a contribution. So, what's the lesson? Why is Ephesians so important? Ephesians 4. Yes, Dave. This is probably not the answer you want, but the lesson is unity is necessary. We need to be united in our mission and our goals and in our demonstrating the character of God. Uniformity is a definite detriment because not everybody has the ability to do everything the same. And you end up compromising those people who are good at this part by trying to make them good at something they're not good at. So you need the unity, but uniformity is a detriment. A uniformity is devil's counterfeit. Because unity is what God is after. Because everyone has a contribution to make. We are all created in his image and we are unique. There is not a human being that you cannot learn from, that you cannot benefit from their perspective, their insights their perception, their way of processing. And if we don't get it, if it's my way or highway, sorry guys, you did not get inspired from reading the storyline. You got that message from somewhere else, from a culture which is not the gospel culture. And Paul says we are not going to tolerate this because God is big on this. He exists in relationships. Father is not the Son, and Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. They are all different. They have all contribution and a role to play in the story of salvation. And somehow, in this 19th century Adventism, homemade people of rugged personalities, where either you do it my way or you are not on God's side, we are not getting the message. 
So let's go to Livius. Is Paul trying to address the religious landscape where they were exposed to many different gods? And they all fought amongst themselves. Even the gods fought amongst themselves. So there was no unity to be had even between the objects that they were worshiping, the gods that they were worshiping. And so he's trying to address that question, that issue. Yes, because the gods are created in humans' image by humans. They reflect the humanity. Yeah. And so the humans can't get together. Gods can't get together. The humans fight together. The gods fight together. And with this, the Bible provides, the revelation provides a completely different perspective. There is only one God, but he's in diversity. He lives in unity. Yeah, and with respect to the diversity, it's designed into nature. If you look at uh, the ecosystem of a coral reef, every member animal of that coral reef relies on another member for its survival. And you look how beautiful a coral reef is because of the diversity and the giving of one member of something that they produce that another member needs. And so that is in the fabric of our existence. So, of course, we need to comply. We need to not be selfish. Alisa, thank you. We can say all of these things, and they all sound wonderful, but it's so hard to achieve. Did anyone promise it will be easy? No, but, well, I'd like to think in education, for example, we have something called differentiated learning, which means we don't expect the students, all 20 students, to learn exactly the same way. And if you are a smart teacher and a caring teacher, you try to find out what's the best way for this student to learn and that student, and then you differentiate your teaching. But I'm going to say it's a whole lot easier in the classroom than it is in the church. And it's not easy in the classroom, but still easier. No, it's not easy in the classroom either, but I think it's far more achievable than it is in the church. And, you know, when Paul gives that illustration of the body and how... The this is important and that is important. I'm going to make a confession that I didn't think every part of the body was as important as he was making it out to be. Until one day, I hurt my foot. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I can't get along without my foot. And so I said, oh, Paul, I'm so sorry. I was denigrating your analogy here, your metaphor, thinking, oh, you know, the foot's not so important. But he was right. It's a wonderful analogy. But I'm telling you, Take any leader in the church. Try to get unity, Daniel. You should know, as the president of the Trans-European Division, not so easy. And what does it take on our part? It takes a sea change. It takes a change of heart, a change of thinking. Because Paul says here, be humble. Always be humble. Danny and I are studying humility now. And do you know there are handbooks this thick written on humility? A handbook on humility, mind you. Did you ever think there'd be one like that? No, I never did, but there are. And the thing is, Paul is saying here, always be humble. And is that the crux of our problem with unity? That really, I think I'm better than you are because I'm a teacher. And not only am I a teacher, I'm a university teacher. You know, I have taught fifth grade, though. But we value, even in our church, we value. And we make it so hard for unity. When Danny and I go to a new church, they always try to find out what profession are you. Have you had this happen to you? It's happened to us a jillion times. And Danny is so cagey and so non-transparent that when the person walks away, I say to Danny, they probably think you belong to the Japanese mafia. And it's like, well, if you're a doctor, well, the church values you more. Well, you can be an elder. They don't do a background check on your morals or what kind of a thing you have. They go, oh, yeah, okay, he's a doctor. He can be an elder. I mean, it's that kind of thinking that prevents us from achieving this unity that Paul tells us to have. And that's why Dr. Luke notices that it's the shepherds Mm -hmm. who get the good news, which is for all the people, because medical doctors in those days were at the bottom of the ladder. And women, Luke talks, but, oh, well, I'll quit ranting and raving, but I'm telling you, unity is no easy thing to achieve. Yeah, welcome to my world. Uh So, all these gifts are there. Why? Verse 13. Until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Because there was not enough diversity, God made it even worse by giving different spiritual gifts. And read Romans 12, read 1 Corinthians 12, 
read First Peter 2 to add more gifts that he didn't have time to mention here in Ephesians 4. So you have other spiritual gifts mentioned there. And what is it for? To maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. To achieve maturity. If you don't use your spiritual gifts, if you don't appreciate the diversity, you cannot achieve maturity. And the measure is Christ himself. We don't compare each other, one another with each other, because you will always find those who are better off, and you will get discouraged, and you will always find those who are worse off, and you feel puffed up. Oh, it's pretty good with me, because I'm not like him, like her. But we don't compare ourselves with each other. The measure is Christ himself. And then he's going to combine three metaphors into one. Because when we are growing into this maturity of fullness of Christ, we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. Three metaphors in one verse. Don't be little babies. Don't be like boat being tossed on a stormy sea. Yes, number nine. And cunning tricksters playing with the loaded dice. So they know what number will come up. You can't. You can't guess it. Because if you are not mature, you are going to be taken for a ride. You are going to end up with a short straw. You are not achieving the potential as a body, and you are not achieving your potential as an individual. It was never God's intention that we go through life alone. Why? Because you can't achieve your potential. You need other people around you, because they help to develop within you things you have no clue they are there. Notice some things take time to develop, so maturity is not overnight. By becoming as a little baby into this world, God put his seal of approval on a slow process. He didn't ask him to die. He didn't send him to the world as a mature male at the age of 30. Okay, now go and die. He didn't ask him to die when he was 12 years old and he understood what is his mission. Oh, that lamb, that's me. Still gives him 18 more years to process that before he starts his ministry. The first 33 years of Christ's ministry are not wasted because God's seal of approval is on a slow process. Maturity does not develop overnight. And if God is patient with me, I need to learn to be patient with me as well. And if God is more patient with me than I ever will be, I need to learn to be patient with other people who are not growing as fast as I would like them to grow up. They are still not getting it. Bob. As this was written when the church was just starting, and in the 2,000-some years since then, it's less unified than it probably was then, and there are even, you know, well, how many denominations are there within Christendom? Quite a few. So if Paul were to come back now, would he say, well, what I meant by unity was one denomination, or would he say, no, this is okay to have many different denominations because they all have a role to play in bringing out different points? Or is that impossible to say what Paul would think? Because we're not unified. He's talking about one church then. Whatever we have now is way more than that. It's like the numbers of sharks, many different types. And that's the difficult balance. So when is it that you can't compromise on truth and you need to separate and just as Peter and Paul shake each other's hand and say, okay, you will go and do your ministry among the Jews, I will go and do my ministry among the Gentiles. We are not going to argue on theology because we are not going to agree. We will sort it out during the millennium in a perfect environment, but until then, you do your ministry here, I do my ministry there. When is it that you need to say, no, we can't agree, we need to separate? And when it is lack of humility and say, Actually, these things are not as significant as you would like to make them because in the heat of the argument, things get out of proportion. I remember when I was in Russia, the church that was split down the middle on whether you put oil into the communion bread or not. Because one group was arguing that when Jesus died on the cross, the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from him, so he did not have the Holy Spirit, and the oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And the other group was arguing that you can't just chew that bread if you don't put oil, it sticks. So you should, <laughs> if you want to enjoy the communion, you need to have some oil in the bread. And they split the church on that. Surely that's a worthy reason to split the body of Christ because of the lack of humility and saying, 
Come on, guys. Let's get some perspective here. Let's get some maturity. And if there is no one to speak a word of wisdom, which is one of spiritual gifts, there is not someone with a gift of discernment. It was amazing as a local pastor to have people on your board with a gift of discernment. You know, a simple old guy, not much schooling or education, but he listened to our discussion and said, guys, if you go in this direction, this will not end up well. It was a word of wisdom, a discernment. Julie? At some point I heard somebody say something about not hearing any sermons anymore on the second coming. I can tell you that I have probably heard more sermons on unity by far in the Adventist church in my life, and particularly in the last few years, than probably almost any other subject, and Sabbath school lessons. And it comes back to it over and over. And I assume that's probably because it's such a difficult thing for all of us naturally. And if we went with what was natural with us at all the time, probably there would be no unity whatsoever. We wouldn't even have a clue about it. But we aim for this. Paul, with all his superlatives, I think is painting a picture of what he wants to be the church. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And I find this topic to be challenging to different cultures in different ways. Start with my own culture. I come from a culture where people tend to be very independent. And I've heard many people say, in fact, they pride themselves on being mavericks, on being outside the box, on being different than everybody else. And they don't really need this church or that group or this person. I hear this a lot in certain places I've worked. And that's a challenge to them is to become a part of an organism, a Christian organism that actually functions. That's a challenge. The other side of it, I've been in places in the world where unity and conformity are very important to the culture, very, very important, and it works well for them. I've been in a place where I worked and taught kids, and all the kids drew the same picture. Every time they had a chance to draw pictures, it was coconut trees. I mean, it was always the same picture with a sunset, and it was really hard to get them to draw anything else. And that was part of the culture, but in that culture, the diversity is a stronger part that has to be emphasized, and we're always uncomfortable. But I think it's good to be uncomfortable. I also think, I could be wrong, when I read all this about the unity and the diversity, is that sometimes we change. And sometimes the gift that God is using us with at a certain time may not be what he uses us later. And we may need some diversity in our experiences so that maybe sometimes as a fish I need to walk a little bit. Uh, um, maybe as a squirrel I need to fly a little bit. If nothing else, so I can see what my brothers and sisters are going through and contributing and appreciate their contribution so much more. So I think it's actually a really important topic, but it's very hard to be practical about it and still be in agreement and be in unity. <laughs> yes, Ashley. Speaking of maturity, I personally, and maybe this is just because of the culture I come up in, but when I send someone with true humility, that is something I respond to very strongly. That is something that I recognize because it's so rare because I don't think that's encouraged in our culture, like certainty, not questioning. That's, I guess, like the thing we think everyone values. But in reality, I think a lot of us will say authenticity, someone that seems real, that's humble. That's truly what I think our spirit like responds to, which is interesting. And I've also noticed that the people that do seem to be the most knowledgeable usually are the most humble. <laughs> And so I've come to the point where when someone feels like really certain about something, that actually makes me more nervous. <laughs> like, do you really, because the more I've grown up and know, the, I feel like the less I know, the less certain I can be that if I was in someone else's situation, that I would do something different. And even um, in trying to be better about praying, and I've realized, have I been really questioning how could I have done better to this past day? How could I have been more loving? And when I start to reflect on that, how has my language reflected maybe some sort of like judgmental attitude I've had? And I don't know if a lot of people, I certainly <laughs> haven't made this enough of a practice myself, but I notice anytime I'm like grouping people together or wanting to like separate myself or my language is such that I am judging or speaking poorly of anyone. I don't know if there's many situations where speaking poorly of anyone is like a, a great thing. I think it's like a very narrow minded. And so, but unless you're really looking for that and paying attention to it in yourself, it's really easy to not see that you're doing that or that your own feelings of discomfort are separating you from people instead of leaning into it and trying to understand someone else's perspective. So I don't know. I think, again, that's where community comes in because you encounter discomfort and you have that choice. Okay, do I try to engage and ask questions in an honest, like curious way? Or do I kind of repel in, yeah, like judgment that I know everything and that my experience is the only one or the only correct one? I think there's good practice around that that 
we're not doing a great job at and that isn't healing these wounds. It's only creating more space. So we just talk about like, yes, we need to be unified. We shouldn't be judgmental. But I really think there needs to be more of like a personal, like inward, like looking when it comes to these things. And often I feel like if people aren't responding well to you, there should be some question because true correction, I think should be used very, very gently. Like I think all too often we're very fast to correct. And then most things, at least in my experience, are much more like fuzzy and gray. And there isn't usually like a clear right or wrong and like across the board situations. And that's exhausting. It's hard to think about that all the time, to be like that critical thinking all the time. It's easier to, our brains like to categorize and label. And so we don't have to think about it, but I don't know any other way. (laughs) And it's all because we didn't have that life altering encounter with grace so that the church, the community of believers, becomes a high priority for us, as it is for Christ, because people matter to God, as it was for Paul after his Damascus experience. Because our individuality, our rights, our perspective are more important to us, and then all human insecurities kick in, and we need to put other people down in the name of truth and God. And it doesn't work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Sherry? The last word. When you were talking about God being patient with us for maturity, that maturity takes time, I was thinking about when you look at the whole picture from the beginning to now, and even when you look at one or two generations currently, I know that Gary and I hope that our children do better than we do, and I think each set of parents hope that for the next generation, that there's growth that there's change in healthy ways. And I think God looks at that from the very beginning. You look at societies, you look at the past and the things that happened. Many of those people didn't understand anything better. It was the way they were raised. We're so much a part of the culture and the surroundings where we are and what we've had opportunity to learn and grow. And I think God looks at all of us in all the different generations and says, I understand. The only thing I ask is that you listen and keep growing. So, Ephesians 4.15, rather, speaking the truth in love. Notice, if you just speak the truth, it can be cutting, it can be hurting, it will do more damage than good. If you just love people, it can be boundaryless. It may not help them unless there is some truth to their love that helps them to make the correction of the course, of the direction. So they both need to go together. And remember, truth in relationship. Love is a relationship, not emotion. You can't tell the truth to someone on the bus stop that you have not met before, because you are not in a relationship. You need to be in a relationship to know the person, to know how to approach them, so that they benefit. This 19th century idea that everybody wants to know the truth. If the sincere soul sees the truth, they will... (laughs) jump on it. Come on. If you have been married, you know what I'm talking about. When my wife says, Daniel, I don't like this about you. That's the last thing I want to hear. And if you are not married, you have a family of origin. You know what you are talking about. How brothers and sisters (laughs) can get on each other's nerves. Because in reality, the truth is the last thing we want to hear. That's why the truth must be in a relationship. A relationship of unconditional acceptance. Why? So that we grow up in every way into him who is the head of the body, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint, is equipped and each part is working properly, and then it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So everybody has a role to play. Otherwise, as Julie mentioned, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, you are going to say, I don't belong. This is not the place for me. Or you are going to say, you better do this, or you are not part of the body. You start blackmailing others into submission. But no, Paul says, every bone is important, every joint is important, every sinew is important. Body of Christ is where fish can swim, rabbits can run, eagles can fly, introverts can flourish, extroverts can find their place. Because in the body of Christ, there is a place and space for everybody. Let's pray. Dear Lord, it's mind-boggling for us that each of us is so unique and so important to you and that you put such high premium on diversity. 
that not only by the fact of creation you created us all different, but by the virtue of redemption you even compound that so that when we all meet together as that crowd of redeemed people in New Jerusalem in perfect environment, there will still be a clearly discerned diversity of each one of us and a contribution that we made in our lives, during our lives, to the body of Christ, to people living around us, and even for all eternity. We have a role and a part to play. It's mind-boggling, it's beyond our understanding, but we certainly are thankful for creating us that way and serving a God who appreciates the contribution that each one of us can make. Help us to make the best use of it for the benefit and blessings of those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was just going to say that revealing truth can happen outside of a relationship. So if we are to be the salt of the earth, we should have people thirst for the kind of relationship that we have with God. So I was just reacting to your statement that said that, you know, you need to be in a relationship to reveal truth. But I think people are always on the outside. Someone is always on the outside outside of your sphere of influence, outside of your group or whatever, and they see your relationship, they see how you behave, they see how you act out God's principles to draw them in, to, to bring them into relationship. Yeah, so probably I should rephrase it. The probability that your truth will make positive impact is increased if you are in a positive relationship. You can't win and antagonize at the same time, so... Yeah, but of course, God can work in different ways. All right, see you in 75 minutes.